Yeah, because of the weekly readings. It's true. Um, Parsha Shmini. It is the twelfth day of the Omer. It is. Um, it is the. Uh, it's uh, obviously Sfirsa Omer. It's. Um, it is a Shabbos that we speak about this sudden, shocking loss of Aaron's two sons. And what I want to address is this concept, Petira, death, sudden death. Obviously in our neighborhood we had a terrible experience recently of a chasen and kala. And um, I want to focus ourselves on not just sudden death, like Nadav and Aviyu, but the moment of death itself. What Chazal say about the moment of death? What is death in the end? And how is it that somebody, like, like have people like Nadav and Avihu, are sucked into death, basically? Um, and the concept of reward and punishment. Death is often associated with punishment. And, uh, and in fact, not just reward and punishment, but, you know, in Judaism, we have a lot of like contra 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 um, contrasting ideas that we always like juxtapose. And what we're going to do today is deal with all of them based on a paradigm, a lens, which you know already, the lens we like to see things through the, and uh, understanding it even further for, through the death of Nadav and Avihu. But ideas like this, there's one fundamental idea, and you know what it is already, that explains Scharva Onesh, what, we, what people call reward and punishment, Tzadik and Russia, Tov and Ra, Olam Hazeh, Olam Haba, Ahava and Yira, okay, Tuma and Tara, all of these juxtapositions are understood through one fundamental idea, which is what we're dealing with here. And that is, of course, the essential idea of what is our relationship with Hashem, okay? Now, let's start with some Pesukim and work out this idea through the Pesukim, okay? And you can already tell me what, what it is, uh, but we'll see again it applied and clearly, almost like really clearly described in these Pesukim. So let's start with the, the, the incident of the death, but you know, prior to that, what, what was the setting? So look in Paraktes and Shemini. Let's set the story up here. Eight, eight. Here is, this is the story of the, finally, the initiation of the Mishkan. So what happened? There was Harsina, remember that? Mm -hmm. And there was the Egel, which we have talked about. And then there was Moshe's time spent on Harsina again. And the giving of the second Luchos, which was on Yom Kippur. And right after Yom Kippur, they start preparations all the way till Nisan, Right, Tishrei to Nisan, and to build, to set up, to organize, the, and plan, and construct the Beis Hamikdash. I'm sorry, the Mishkan. All right, and finally, the whole thing's ready to go. Now, the whole objective of the Mishkan was to restore that 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 um, that state, that state of closeness, which was. Achieved, which was experienced at Matan Torah, and then which was lost at the Eagle, and then through till Tish, till Tishrei, till Yom Kippur, Moshe was working on some sort of restoration, and then Hashem said, through the Mishkan, the through the pro, through the building of the Mishkan, and then through the Avoda, the ongoing Avoda that will take place in the Mishkan and later in the Beis Hamikdash, you will be able to restore the state of. God being present and you, uh, among you and your uh, capacity to go somewhere, you'll have this ability to go somewhere and see Hashem's presence all around you. Hashem's presence among us is always referred to as the Shechina. The root of the word Shechina is Shochin. Often thought of as the indwelling of Hashem among us. But actually... In a deeper sense, it means that we are aware, not so much that Hashem is dwelling in us, but we are dwelling very much within the everythingness of Hashem. If we're aware of that, then we do not imagine that we are living in our own separate space, okay, 
Remember the muscle we give? We work with two basic muscles all the time. What are they? The fetus. The fetus in the womb or curtain. the curtain. Good. So when we're aware that the curtain, that that curtain's kind of artificial or that separate space is kind of an artificial construct that we need to use to, right? Then we recognize we're in the shechina. And then having that awareness is referred to Having that awareness is referred to as the kavod of Hashem. Okay? When we say, Baruch Shem kavod malchuso, kadosh, 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 Hashem, tzavakos, malo, kol arts, kavodo, kavod is kavod malchus, our awareness of our being contained within the everythingness of Hashem so that everything is seen and understood through that lens. That's called the kavod of Hashem everywhere. It doesn't mean that Hashem created us because He needed people to praise Him. Okay? When we say that hakol bara lechvodo, everything was created for His kavod, we mean that everything in the physical world, if you look at it carefully and you look at it correctly, you will be able to use it as a vehicle to help you perceive that we exist within the covenant of Hashem. That's what it means, everything was created for His covenant. Right? You hear that? Clear? Not that everything was created so that it could praise God because He's nebuch, uh, in, feels inadequate and needs praise or something, okay? So, so now here's what happens. They're building, they're, they've built the Mishkan. Everybody did their best, 100% L'Shem Shemaim. But before you start using it, it goes through a process like the world, a seven-day process culminating in the eighth day, okay, of like initiation called Chanukah Samishkan, where everything gets like officially, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Dedicated to this purpose. Now, seven and eight, let's go there for a second, okay? Seven is always Olam Hazet, and it includes Shabbos, meaning Hashem set up Sheshis Mebrashis, that would be operation in front of the curtain, which in Kohelis is referred to as Tachas Hashemesh. Keeps going back to everything is Hevel, Tachas Hashemesh. If it's only Tachas in front of the curtain, it's just, it, it becomes fleeting and you, don't, you can't get to its real, you can't give you anything. Okay? <coughs> Hashem set up six days in which we operate in front of the curtain, Tachas Hashemesh, in our physical space. But everything here is meant to, again, be a vehicle to remind us and to lead us and to reveal to us this truth that everything is really an expression of the Kavod Hashem. We're part of it. Okay. On Shabbos, okay, the seventh day, which is part of the unit of how we operate here, we must always have a day in which we lift the curtain a little bit. Or we operate as if the curtain is lifted or that there's a transparency in that wall between the baby and the mother or the fetus, okay? What does that mean? It means that malacha on Shabbos, right? Remember this? It, the 39 malachas break down into three categories. Food, clothing, and shelter. Anything you need to do to acquire for yourself food, clothing, and shelter, you don't do. So that it's all done before Shabbos. So when Shabbos starts, it's there. It's ready for you just to use it. In other words, for Shabbos, we experience what it would be like to live in a world where everything is provided for. And you don't have to do anything to provide for yourself. Because Shabbos is the day where you go back, so to speak, into that consciousness that we had at Sinai, that they're going to about to get on the Mishkan, uh, on this eighth day, that we are all really part of the everythingness of Hashem, in which case we are not here to struggle and to panic and to live in fear and try to secure our existence because it's already provided for. That's Shabbos. So Shabbos, you could lift, you carry this table up and down the stairs a thousand times. You're not Machal Shabbos. But if you light a match to boil yourself a cup of tea, total chil Shabbos because what are you doing something for yourself? Why are you doing something that shows that you have to take care of your own survival? So Shabbos, we just eat and get dressed and enjoy, and it's all provided for. It's all already there without effort. So that's the seven, the unit of six plus one. And we always have to balance the seven with the six. And the seven, that experience of Shabbos is supposed to stay with us the whole week so that we can go back into the week and interpret everything as some sort of an expression of the everythingness that we're part of. So far, so good? Yeah. 
The eighth day, okay, represents above that. It means when the curtain just goes up, period, and that's it. You're, you're done. Okay? The wall is transparent. You're part of Hashem. That's it. You get it. There's nothing else. Now, what happens in that is you could lose, you will lose your sense of self. You will lose your sense of self, that you're a separate entity. And that everything of, your, of our physical world is real. That will just vanish. So, for example, when we have the number Sphira, 49 and then 50, here we go. It's 7 times 7. So it's the full expansion of the experience of this world, which always includes the element of Shabbos to keep us balanced. At the end of the entire full expansion of that, the total experience, you get to 50. 50 is Shavuos. That's the total revelation. What happens when the curtain went up? What happened to Amishol? Parcha nishmasam. What does that mean? We're going to talk about the separation of the neshama from the body today. Petira. <coughs> Their neshamas left them. What does that mean? It means we, were, we ceased to be able to even have any, have any um, b- belief in our existence as some type of real thing. It was an illusion. We were part of Hashem's existence. We ceased to operate as separate entities or to perceive ourselves like that. Is that understood? The word call, chaf lamid, is gematria 50. It represents that state. Okay? That's a whole other issue. We've spoken about call in the past. So, so far, so good. This is Yom HaShmini. It was super clear to Moshe and Aaron. This was a very, very precarious time. Because what will happen when that curtain goes up is we will see the truth, see that what we're part of, and no longer care or want to operate as if we were separate and then get caught up in all the traps of the material world as if things really matter and they really were eternal and they really were the source of our existence or identity or of our, any, you know, we just wouldn't want, it would be hard to negotiate that clarity, just like on Harsinai, because Hashem said, if you build the Mishkan, I will dwell among you, which means you will have that clarity. So now, you have to treat the Mishkan with extreme precautions. You could lose your existence by getting too close. You'll just merge back in. So there's endless laws. The entire Sefer Vayikra is halachas of separation, Kedusha, staying back from that place, only approaching under extreme circumstances, are very, very circumscribed circumstances of Kedusha, of Tara, and we're going to talk about those words mean, have the right, only certain people at certain times, in certain spaces, certain places, like a very, very cautious situation here. Because you can't just find yourself there, you'll just vanish. Okay? So, now, look what happens. So Moshe tells them in Perek Tess, Pasuk Vav, you do everything right. But Yomar Moshe, Zeh Hadavar Shertziva Hashem Tasu. There's going to be a whole protocol now to initiate the Mishkan. Very, very specific details. He says, Vayera Alechem Kavod Hashem. If you do it right, the Kavod Hashem is going to appear to you. And that's not something to take lightly. Because, as we said, you can, you know, if you get too close, you're, fin- you're gone. So, if you, so, um, so, this is Moshe prepares, and then he starts telling them how, what to do, what to do, what to do. And then in Pasuk Chaf Dalid, okay, <coughs> they did everything right, all the exactly, precisely what Hashem said to do to initiate the Mizbeah. And Pasuk Chaf Dalid says, V'teitze eish milifnei Hashem, a fire comes out, and not just a physical fire, from Miflei Hashem, V'tochal al ha-Mizbeah ha-Sa'ola v'sachalavim, and it came down from heaven, so to speak, whatever that experience looked like, and nobody lit a fire on the Mizbech, rather. A fire from Hashem appeared and consumed the karbonos that were waiting on the Mizbech. This was the, this is the Kavod Hashem that Moshe told them will appear. What you will see. It's expressed as a fire taking the Ola off the, car, off the Mizbech. And the reaction of the nation is, Vayar kol ha'am. The nation was able to see it. It's a real seeing seeing a little bit of like what they saw in Har Sinai, which they didn't survive, obviously, that experience. They exalted and they fell on their faces, meaning they, went, they just 
basically kind of um, not just uh, the word is uh, they they um, they falling on the faces mean uh, this this reaction of overwhelming subjugation. awareness and all and also the awareness not just subjugation yes inevitable the surrender inevitable deference inevitable a reaction that I am nothing I don't really exist other than in my role as part of this light this of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and you know and uh, and I'm completely I recognize myself as subs- completely subsumed within it that's for Yiplu al Pnehem. Okay, now what do you think happens? You know what happens here. Bnei Aaron, two sons, are too, too. They're too attracted to it. They're too connected. Okay, they, they, they know what they're doing. By the way, they bring a katoris. They went overboard. They went too far. They crossed the boundary. That same fire, but Tese Eish Milifne Hashem, same words. Instead of the Karbanas, but Tochal Osam, it's consumed them. Vayamusu Lifne Hashem, meaning they died in this seeing, like trying to see the Panim, the full face of Hashem. That was it. They were there. That they couldn't survive that. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is we have to go and compare now. There was another. There was another moment. I go back to Shemos Lamed Gimel. We want to compare this. Shemos 33. Okay, at the moment of Harsinai, it's in Parshas Mishpatim. And there's a very, you know, esoteric, obviously, Pasuk that you, we're not even beginning to understand. <coughs> okay, this is the moment of the revelation. Look at page 440. Actually, we start at page 440, Pasuk 9. This is the moment of that. Vayal Moshe va'aron v'nadav avihu v'shivim mizik neishol Moshe aron nadav avihu. These two, and elders, seventy elders went up. Went up doesn't just mean physically. They went into a state of nevuah, okay, where they're going to break through that boundary. They're going to pick up the curtain, okay. It's going to be page four forty. Now page, turn the page. The Yeru S Elokei Yisrael. They saw Elokei Yisrael. The next pasuk we have, you'll, you'll look in the Rashi's. This is all metaphorical, not literal. We're talking very kabbalistic ideas here. V'tachas raglav, and under his feet, Hashem's feet, kamasa livnas hasafir, like a sapphire brick. Uke'etem hashamayim letohar, and it was like the essence of heaven in purity. Okay. The Esatzile B'nei Yisrael and to the great men, these great people who are seeing this, Lo Shalach Yado, he did not send out his hand, Vayechazu Zelokim, and they perceived God, they gazed at God, eating and drinking. Now, let's go into the Rashi's here. This is obviously, what's going, you know, this needs the caution to even understand. So, the Yiru Eseloke Yisrael. His nistaklu vehetzitu v'neschayvu misa. They saw and they gazed and they were really worthy of death. Okay, we're going to get to punishment and tumentara. All these ideas are coming up here. All right, but what happened? Hashem didn't. Ela shalo ratzah kadosh baruch hu la arbeiv simchas haTorah. So he didn't want to mar the joy of the giving of the Torah. So he waited until this event where they kind of did it again, and then he took their, and then they lost their lives, okay? But in the case of Harsinai, the elders, and other than Avihu and Aaron, were invited to have that experience. So look, it says, Vayochu Vayishtu. So hold on. Now, Bamasa Livnas Hasapir, they saw some sort of sapphire brick. This means, okay, according to Rashi, the brick represented their shibud. Their slavery in Mitzrayim, which made no sense to Am Yisrael, and this is the case of Sadik Viralo suffering. But to Hashem, it was like a sapphire, okay, meaning precious, necessary and precious. He had this brick that represented the Shibud, Lizkor Tsarasan, to represent their Tsara, Shal Yisrael, that they had to make bricks. And it was as clear as the essence of heaven in purity, in Tahara, okay. 
מי שנגאלו, היה אור וחד ולפניו, when they became redeemed, they understood that this suffering, this brick, was really like the essence of, of, of tahara, which means they were able to appreciate it as tahara. We're going to get to tahara and tamay in one second. What does tahara actually mean? By the way, anyone know what tahara means? Clear. Clear, transparent. Transparent. Curtains up. You remember well, transparent. Okay? They saw that transparently that this brick was precious. It was like a sapphire, this suffering. Okay? Ke'etzem, uh, okay, letohar, lashan barur v'tzalo, clear and see-through, like crystal, okay? Ve'elat silein, to the great ones, nadav and avihu, and the kenim. Lo shalach yado, what does this metaphor mean? He didn't stretch out his hand, what do you think it means? What does it mean, Hashem stretching out his hand? Okay, like taking them. He didn't. He let them maintain physical existence Although they were in a state where it shouldn't, it wasn't natural. It was too much. It was uh, uh, of, uh, you know, too much of the clarity and the connection. So what is the lo shalach yado? Mechal shahayu ruuyim l'shtalach behemad. It really was. They should have been drawn right in, but he, there was something unique and special and unexpected. They did. They weren't. But yechsu es elokim. They gazed at Hashem. They were looking with some type of uh, sense of self, and eating and drinking, meaning combining these two things, don't, you can't do both at the same time. All right, now, this Hamosh had said to them, the covet of Hashem is going to appear. He cautioned them what could happen to be careful, and they were very careful. And when the covet did appear on the Mizbeach, everyone, by Yiplu of the name, which is the right response. Nav and Naviho took it to the next step. They wanted more. And that, as we said, just takes us back to Arsina where they also wanted more, but Hashem didn't draw them in. All right? From here, we're going to um, look at something else. Go to Shmos, Perek Lamed Gimel. Jump ahead. This is the Egel. Pasuk Yud Beis. We're going to add this to the mix. When Moshe was on Har Sinai, asking Hashem to allow Am Yisrael, okay, to have both Hashem's presence among them, which means a certain degree of clarity, but not the full degree that they had at the, at the first Dibros, and also still allow Am Yisrael to exist as separate entities, human beings with Bechira and sin. In other words, Hashem, Moshe is asking, let us live... Let us have this, um, let me go back a second, okay, to clarify this. The first Luchos and the second Luchos. The first Luchos was a moment, that first experience of Shavuos, Kabbalah Satorah, Matan Torah, was a moment, as we said, of absolute clarity, okay? Am Yisrael could not sustain that. We were not there, and in fact, the world was not designed to live with that, because that's the world of... Olam Hanashamas, when we're not really physical, we don't perceive ourselves as physical, real creatures so much anymore. We still have a physical veneer, the Ramchal says, but we are experience ourselves as spiritual entities. So that first, the first Luchas, that first experience was not something sustainable. We did, we spoke about this. So why does Hashem do it? So that we should experience and know forever that is the ultimate achievement. But we're going to have to get there through our own work, through, through using this world to get to that place. We're going to have to raise the curtain. When Hashem raises it for us, it's overwhelming. Slowly but surely, we're going to raise it. Now, the wor- when Hashem gives us the first luchos, there's one word that does not appear in the first luchos. Remember? Anyone remember what this is? The word that means sustainable, suitable for tov. tov. The word tov only appears in the second luchos. Remember? This is because tov and ra, we've discussed many times, tov means it's sustainable, it's suitable for your purpose. Ra means it's unsuitable for your purpose. Okay, you can't work. We, what happens is that the Jewish people, obviously, you know, they can't accept this absolute level of clarity, and they go and they, um, they make the agel, which represents some sort of um, concretizing, okay? Concretizing of the idea of that Shekhinah and bringing it, you know, into this world, but not just concretizing it 
externalizing it from themselves. Remember that idea? Externalizing it. They couldn't deal with being part of it. They wanted to externalize it. Okay, it's over there. They wanted to pull the curtain down. We know where it is. We'll go there when we need it. But we otherwise, we want to be who we are. So Moshe breaks the luchos. The breaking of the luchos represents, is a, it's, sim, it's, con, it's a, connected to a spiritual concept, a Kabbalistic concept you might have heard called the breaking of the vessels. Okay, meaning that Am Yisrael, breaking the luchos, that state of existence without a curtain, is, Am Yisrael couldn't absorb it. Moshe then breaks the luchos. The Kabbalistic idea is that the pieces, like the, the, the vessels that shattered, are everywhere, and we're beginning to pick them up and put them back together and raise the curtain ourselves. Okay. Here, Moshe is now asking for the second luchos, which means let's have this, put the curtain back down, let us have a place to go find it, like the Mishkan, but also operate in front of it. You know, we need to have this balance. So then, at that point, Moshe says to HaKadosh Baruch he asks him a question. He says, Horeini na eskvodecha, show me your cover. For me, pick up the curtain. Let me see the big picture. What Moshe was also asking there, Rashi tells us, for example, Tzadik Viralu, show me the whole thing. I want to see the kavod. I want to see how every single thing in this world is part of it. I want to see the big picture, and then I'll understand how all the little individual incidents all are part of that. Exactly what Eov wanted to see, too, by the way. At Moshe wrote Eov, according to most. So, because Eov was suffering, he wanted to also say, I demand an explanation. Show me the whole thing. Okay, now Hashem said to Moshe, if you look in Pasuk, if you look in Pasuk Yudbeis, okay, he says, um, yeah, in Pasuk, uh, in Pasuk, sorry, in Pasuk, he, I'm sorry, let, to, to be honest, in Pasuk Yudbeis through Tezayin, he says, Hodieni nostra show me how you run the world, which Hashem does give him an answer, he gives him the 13 meters, and then when he sees Hashem is answering him, he asks for more. He says, he says, um, in Pasuk Yudches, Okay, in addition to that, show me the big picture. So Hashem answers him, and in Pasuk Chafen he says, Lo tocha liros aspana, you can't see my face, which means everything. Ki lo your ani ha'adam v'chai, a human can't see me and live. In other words, I pick up the curtain, you can't live anymore. You're not, you're not, in, you can't pretend it's not, you know, you're going to be absorbed back into the, the non-physical ev- everythingness of Hashem. You can't. Either you're going to be a person, or you're not going to see. You can't be a person and see, which is what Nadav and Aviyu played with. Okay? So, um, so uh, then he says, but I'm going to put you, if you look in the rest of the Pesukim, I'm going to put you in the rock. All of this is very Kabbalistic, and I'm going to pass. I'm going to put my palm over, over you, and then you're going to see my back, meaning you'll get little glimpses, but you're not going to see the whole thing. Okay? You'll get some type of version which is called the back okay now we've spoken about the, just a, as a cap uh, as a you know just a side remember the Kesher tefillin you say in Anim Zemiros that when Hashem when he saw the back of Hashem he saw the Kesher tefillin mm-hmm. my grandfather explained to me remember this yeah. you all know this right do I need to repeat it I yes. Mm, yes and no. Yes. So the, 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 the Kesher tefillin. When you look at when you look at a man wearing tefillin, okay, you see a right strap and a left strap, and a right strap and a left strap. And if you just look at him from the front, you say the right is the right and the left is left. But if you turns around, there's a knot back here, the base of the neck. I see the right strap is left and the left strap is right. Meaning, my grandfather said, that which you see here in this lower world, where our hearts are and our bodies are, looks one way. And it's probably the exact opposite in the upper worlds where our thoughts exist. Moshe was being told, don't, you're not seeing the big picture. You might even be seeing something that's completely opposite. You, what you think you're seeing is the opposite of what's really going on. So I then told my grandfather, you know, I was an ultrasound in my first Gilgul. I was an ultrasound tech. And I said, you know, in anatomy and physiology, we learned that the reason a person gets a stroke in the right brain and is paralyzed on the left and vice versa is because right here, the nerves traveling up the spinal cord cross right under the Kesher Tefillin. It's called the decussation of the pyramids. I think it's in your notes in some. And uh, the physical body represents these truths. That's what we were saying. Malo kol haaretz kavodu. If you see 
this world is all a way of discovering this kavo, that, it's, that we're in the Shechina, we're dwelling in Hashem's existence. So, so he said, yeah, you know, of course, it, it, obviously, it's a beautiful thing. But um, so Hashem says to Moshe, you, you, you can't see the front, okay? Moshe asks for the kavo. Now, he is telling them on Yom Hashmini, the kavod's going to appear, super caution. Remember how Moshe, Hashem kept telling Moshe about Har Sinai, make a fence, make a fence. He said, you already told me to make a fence. No, make a fence. Don't let anybody come up. This is keeping the separation. That's the balance we're living with. Now, here is a measure so I want to focus on, talking about Petira, the moment of death, Angel, no, the Navihu, our story, and these, these ideas, I hope that we're going to now discuss Tomatara, Tzadik, Russia, Tovra, Schar Onish, it all works out of this idea. So the Medrash in um, Bamidbar, in Parshas Nasso, it's a, what they call Perak 14, says like this, okay? Yeah, do you see it in your notes? See? So Rabbi Dosa uh, says, okay, Rabbi Dosa Omer, it's only in Hebrew, it's not, I didn't say find it in English anyway. Rabbi Dosa Omer. In Shemos Lama Gimel Chaf, it says, Kilo Yirani Ha'adam Vachai. You cannot see me. A human being cannot see me and live. So, Bechayehem. Okay, so I'll read the Pirish here. This is from uh, the Midrash with the Pirish. So he says, Kilo Yirani Ha'adam Vachai. Kishu Omer Vachai, Hu Omer Kain. Bechayehem Enam Roim. In their lives, they cannot see. Aval Roim. But they do see at the moment of their death. So he, the Pirish here quotes Aval Roim Kavyochel Bishas Misasan at the time of their death. Here is a statement from the Medrash itself in another place. Ein Niftarim Min Haolam Ad Sharoim Pnei Hashchina. This is a rule. There is nobody is niftar min this from this world until they see the face of the shkina. First of all, the word putter. Putter means I'm free from this. I don't have to do it anymore. Right? Isn't that what putter means? I'm absolved. It's over. I don't need to do this. I don't have this obligation. A person is not putter from this life. They're not free of this responsibility. Okay? They're not done with this job of experiencing themselves as physical creatures, ad sheroe es hashchina, es pnei hashchina, and is a guarantee. Again, the measure says, ki lo yorani adam v'chai, you cannot see me live. V'chayeihem enam roim, aval, roim heim b'shas misasan. We all see, the curtain goes up. Be, the wall becomes transparent at the time of Petira. Now, Petira, that means, by definition, we're putter from viewing this world as an absolutely real thing. Okay, and, and relating to it as if it's the only thing. Okay, now, he says here, Ein neshama yotzei min haguf ad shetira hashchina. This is Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. A neshama doesn't leave the guf until it sees the shechina. Okay? Let's talk about this. When that happens for every single person, obviously we cease to relate to the physical world as we, off, as we normally do. It's like waking up from a dream. Everything here is a source of kavod. We said that. A kol bar means everything is here to direct you, to guide you, to reveal to you this truth that we will all see at the moment of Petira, everybody. Adam. Okay? When we see that truth, okay, that's it. That's the whole story. Now, what happens there, first of all, A, you no longer relate to this world in the same way you relate to it, which means, and I don't, I couldn't find a source, but I've heard this over the years. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not saying this until I actually find a source, but I have heard that at the moment of Petira, let's say in a time which we would perceive as a painful time, since the neshama sees it's artificial, it doesn't feel that physical pain. Because it's like a dream. Okay? Now, what that means is, at that moment, all right, is at the same time for everybody, it becomes a different experience. It's schar and it's onesh all together. It's ganeden and gehenim all together. 
Rav Hunter explains, um, I remember reading this so many years ago, that the mistake we made, we make often about thinking about Schar and Onesh, is because we say like this, we say, okay, I'm going to do a project for this boss, and he's going to pay me $1,000. So the project and the $1,000 have absolutely nothing to do with each other. It's like some random, uh, you know, kind of right, um, reward for, uh, you know, some, for some work. The idea of Scharva Onish is nothing like that at all. Scharva Onish is the curtain going up. Either a person says to the, ah, oh, finally, I always knew it. I always knew it. I was seeing glimpses of it. I couldn't wait to see the whole thing. I never didn't realize it. I never believed that everything happening in front of the curtain was the whole story. I never took it too seriously. I never became depressed and anxious and, and, def and felt that I was defeated or, or angry or jealous or hopeless or full of self-pity or distressed. Or, or I never did because I knew what it was. So that moment is a moment of bliss. And Rambam says in the Hilchus Tshuva, we've done this also in the end in chapters 8 and 9, which talk about all about this, that Olam Baba is Das. It's Das. It's total understanding. For those that always worked on achieving Das and used everything of this world to get to that Das, and uh, that is a moment of bliss. And don't forget, Das means the total integration of something that is thought of as separate from us, it becomes us. That's why even a husband and a wife, that union, or two separate things become, people become one. It's the Adam Yada. It's, that's the biblical knowing, Das. It's the total integration of myself and what I thought was separate from myself. Okay? That's Das. Ram says the whole of Olam Haba is called Das. It's all Das. For those who knew it, it's pure bliss. Nenim Miziv Hashrina. Just enjoyment of the radiance of the Shechina. But for those who refuse to believe it, who insisted it's not true, who got totally identified with the things of this world and their little story in front of the curtain, which didn't make sense anyway, but they gave it explanations to make it make sense, they're going to be in shock, you know, the brothers of Yosef. And it's going to be Gehenim. It's all the same thing. Now, the good news is that the shock and the embarrassment, it fades. Remember, you only say Kaddish for 11 months and da-da-da again. It fades away. Eventually, a person gets comfortable in the Shekhinah. Okay? This is Shekhar, this is Onish. This is Toma, this is Tara. Remember the brick of sapphire that was Tohar pure? Tohar, Rashi says, you, see, you, you can see right through it. It's transparent. You don't take, you see through that curtain a little bit. Not a lot, teeny glimpses, but you know that one day you're going to see through it. Okay? Tom, Tame, shh, dark, con disconnection. What makes us, what could make us become Tame? What's the avi avot of Tuma, the father of all Tuma? Death. Because the normal, the so called default reaction to death is physical life is everything and now it's over. That's it. <coughs> and then distress and sorrow and pain and fear and horror, right? It's over. There's nothing left. That's called tuma. It's blocked. Immediately we get the person out of that state. They go into a tara. Okay? They go into tara. And, <coughs> and we, in, the state, in, that, in that state of tuma, we become, we become tame because it's inevitable that a person thinks like that to some degree. Okay? And the nechama that we give to an uncle, where my grandfather explains nechama, means change of perspective. Now, you, don't, you can't do it right away with a person, but at some point, the real message is this shift in perspective. It's not true that this is all it is, and etc. And we're very, very close to this idea. We know this idea very well. It's a deeply Jewish idea because we experienced it at Harsina. That's what That was what changed us forever. We knew it. That's Tomentara. That's Schar Onesh. Okay? What about Tovara? Easy. Anything that we engage in that is suitable for the purpose of keeping us aware that we are not behind some wall that's, you know, blocking us and that, and that that's a reality, that's tov. Anything that makes us think that we're disconnected and alone and this, that, that's ra. Okay? Therefore, yisurim could be tov because when a person realizes that if I only operate in, with my story that I see, 
and I'm in distress, and I'm afraid, and I'm vulnerable, and I don't, I don't know who to turn to. So I start turning to the people in my world, this doctor and this couple and this thing, and, say, and they can't help me, okay? Then I'm all alone. And then you have a person has absolutely two choices. There's only two choices in how to see the world, and now we could think about our story. There's two choices. Life is what you see is what you get. It's random. Some drunk driver who's on drugs, who's having a drag race. You know, the luck of the draw, too bad. That's how it is. Life stinks. You, you know, try to get, you know, don't drive down that road anymore, uh, or whatever, and you'll be, you know, try to protect yourself, and that's what it is. That's option A. <laughs> when a person has you serve him, often they don't want to opt for that. It's no, you can't live with it. You can't. You can't opt for that. So there's only one other option, which is that actually, okay, what I'm seeing is not the whole story. And there's a much bigger story that I'm part of, and I can't see it. But if I, when I see it, everything will make sense, which is why when they were at Har Sinai, this is the big issue, they saw that that brick, that brick was as pure as the essence of heaven, Latohar, purity, they saw through. And it was a sapphire, it was precious. That's the main issue of Harsini. They saw that they <coughs> had to view this world. And they understood that even the Yisurim were precious. And that's why they said in the <coughs> Shira, Mi chamocha be'elim Hashem, and what does Rashi say? Be'elmim. They praised Hashem for being an Elim. An Elim means someone who doesn't speak, mute. So Hashem, they never understood. How could you see our tsaris and be silent? And then at the Shira, at the Yam, where the curtain went up, and the Shifcha saw more than Yechezkel ben Buzi, the great Makobo, or the great Navi, the Navi, they said, oh, they praised Hashem for his silence, for that whole process. Okay? That's the brick of sapphire that was pure as heaven. And, and, um, and that, that, so even things that seem so horrible have an element of tov because they push us. Now, I'm not saying, okay, we'll get to it. They push us to say it's either or. Either I see that there's something much bigger that I'm part of and none of this is the whole story. And that means if nothing that I, in front of my little picture is the big story, then nobody in my story has real power anyway. And I stop turning and depending on this particular doctor or that particular <coughs> boss or this particular Makobo, right? Because they are not really providing for me. They're in the same predicament I'm in. They know just as little as I know, maybe a little more, but compared to real knowledge, they don't really know. And therefore, I am going to turn to the only one who can provide for me, and that's Hashem. And we stop depending. If I would have only gone to that Rav for a bracha, then it would have been different. I've only gone to that Makobo, or if I would only gone to that doctor, as if they provide. No, it's forgetting that we go right to Hashem. Hashem provides for all of us, and there's that's the way to look. There's that's the other option to look at the world, okay? And now, again, in the big picture, why these two people at this particular moment in this particular situation? You know, two if they would have left Muncie two hour two minutes later, it would have been different, right? So that is again. The big picture. Sometimes in our lives we get teeny little glimpses of the pieces coming together and we see a story that maybe goes back 500 years. So, oh, because of that led to this, you know? That's the classic story. We always, always mention like the Haman Esther connection, correct? Little did he know that when he got rid of Vashti, which he did for his own purposes, making way for Esther, he was finishing a story that started 500 years ago where Shaul, Esther's grandfather, didn't kill Agag, his grandfather. Right? That, that's one. But we also see this in our lives in many little ways. We all have stories about how things come together in this incredible connection. So this, this is, again, Tov and Ra. You know, in the end, the Ramchal says, the Ramchal says, remember we did this? There's two types of Hanhagot. One is called Hanhagot HaMishpat, in front of the curtain. You have, you have to live a certain way. You have to live with the mitzvahs. It's imperative to live with the mitzvahs because they are the only mechanism that keep us clear about this whole perspective. The mitzvahs do it. If we don't, it's no good. There's even a Sanhedrin that, that says you've got to do this. If you don't, we're going to punish you. We're going to sanction you. You have to behave like this. 
So there's something called Hanhagas Hamish, but you gotta behave a certain way that's for our benefit. The other Hanhagas, when the curtain goes up, he Ramchal calls it Hanhagas Hayichud, you see it's all one thing. And then the Ram calls the first one in the 1750s to really, really take these Kabbalistic ideas and put it out there in philosophical language for the masses. And he said, there is no Ram. There's nothing that's not suitable to get us to that perspective. Somehow or another, everything does, if we, if we understand, if we look through it that way. Also, Tovara, Scharva Onesh, what do we say? Um, Tahar Tuma Tara. What's a tzaddik? What's a rasha? Everybody's in this together. The tzaddik knows it, and therefore they're not conniving and cheating and stealing to outmaneuver this one in a survival of the fittest frenzy to secure my existence at the <coughs> expense of your existence. The tzaddik's not bothering with any of that. They have a muna <coughs> that they'll see it one day. They go through life doing their best but not having a defeatist attitude if they can't accomplish something they tried to accomplish because we don't have <laughs> unlimited abilities. We are very limited in the things we can do based on the variables in, in the world and in our lives. So they don't get defeated and they live, like Kohela says, enjoying the moment, the effort, the satisfaction they get from doing the right thing right now. Okay? It's Russia lives in a state as if they're all alone and lives in a state of panic, ultimately destroying themselves and others, terror trying to find ways to secure their existence and soothe themselves of the terrible anxiety along the way. And so there's this self-destruction and, of course, destruction of others because what's the difference anyway? Now, by the way, a Russia, you should just let me end, let me say this and I'll take questions. The first pair in Tehillim, we've mentioned this too, uh, Rada, uh, all the Mepharshim, there are a bunch of Mepharshim there, May, bring down the definition of the word Russia. Anybody remember what it is? Doesn't mean somebody who hates Hashem and tries to. That's an Oyev, that's a Sone. What's a Russia? No, it's just a little bit more. Why do they, why, why they go back and forth? Why do they. Why? Why do we vacillate? The word Russia comes, is like the Shorish of the word Laharshia. Laharshia means chaos and tumult, like the waves in the ocean, like chaos, like pandemonium. In other words, just, just lurching from thinking, meaning the Russia is, a moment of Russia means, we always identify with a horrible person, but really it's not what it means. It means we have moments of clarity, epiphanies, connection, and then, so, you know, like, to, to, you know, Tahara, clear, see, we see clearly, or whatever we can see, and then boom, in the next second, Darkness, the curtain drops down, and all I care about is I'm jealousy about that particular item that I need, or that person who doesn't think I'm great, or that I must <coughs> eat that food right now, or say that to that person right now because they ticked me off. Like it just vanishes. We go back and forth. We lurch from clarity to confusion, clarity to confusion, back forth, back forth, just lurching, constant lurching, inconsistent. That's what Russia really just means inconsistent. A tzaddik is consistent. They all they do the mitzvahs because it keeps them focused and then they keep getting clearer and clearer. That's really the difference. All these ideas, again, they all fall in, they all make sense with this paradigm, right? Does anybody have, uh, you know, questions on this or, uh, or want clarification on this idea? Deb? Um, I've heard Shiram that say that if you wanted, let's say, for some reason to go to a mosque or something, it's not a vote of like going into a church because the God that the Muslims believe in is like our God. So how can we understand their behavior as um, being right. a shy? They do have a, I, I don't know enough about Islam, but I, we all know they have a concept of a single God. Yeah. But again, I, this, this is a very important idea. And you know, you could when Saini and Daba comes online, I did, this is the subject I did, the Eov subject. The problem with Eov and his friends, and most of the world, and why Moshe wrote the Sefer, and what Hashem was pushing Eov to accomplish, but he didn't. His, he remained with his friends as in, a, in a state of a too simplistic emuna. Okay? And Amishol has a more advanced, we've graduated because we saw. Right? The simplistic emuna is, there is a single God, remember that? And he controls everything, and he sustains everything. And then there's us down here, separate. And we're physical. And Hashem said, because I control everything, if you follow my rules, 
I'll give you what you need. But if you make me angry and you don't follow my rules, I'll punish you and I won't give you and you'll be miserable. You'll suffer in this world. Okay? So basically the entire relationship is let's make a deal. Remember that? We keep God happy. He keeps us happy. Yes, you can have a concept of a single God who controls everything and still operate from a simplistic and ultimately toxic perspective which is, I need to keep God happy, and he needs to keep me happy. Therefore, Eov said, by the way, Eov and his friends had a huge argument, but they're both coming from the same place. Eov said, excuse me, I was a tzaddik. I did everything right. I did everything you wanted. So you, what's, I, I demand an explanation about why you're not keeping your side of the deal. You're giving me tzaras. This is not okay. Uh, you are violating your side of the deal. What Hashem wanted from Eov is to get to a place which he did not get to, and therefore he doesn't serve as a spiritual role model for anybody, but it's really Moshe explaining, because we don't even know if Eov was real. It could have been a mushal. Moshe is explaining the problem of Tzadik Baralo. He's dealing with the Tzadik. That's the safer. He's saying, if we operate from a place, I'm keeping you happy, why are you not keeping me happy? This isn't fair. This makes no sense. Hashem does not respond, by the way. Eov is met with stony silence because the entire perspective is wrong. By the way, the friends come and say, that's right, it's a deal. So clearly, you did make a mistake, you did fail. Clearly, you did not live up to your side of the deal. And if you just do tshuva, everything will be fine because you're right, it's a deal. So what Hashem wanted uh, Eov to get to is not that kind of monotheism, not that kind of righteousness, which is opportunistic and utilitarian, but rather a concept that since you, I'm perfect and you now are causing me to suffer, it must be that this is not a deal. It must be something more is going on here. It must be you're pushing me to recognize that there's nothing really to turn to, no one to help me, nobody that can save me other than Hashem. And to get to a point of my amuna where I stop thinking about or, or depending on others and things. He was saying, give me back my fortune. Give me back my family. Give me back the things that are me, that I, did, that I identify with in this world. And Hashem wanted Eov to graduate to what we experienced. Now, very interesting. Eov lived 210 years. What is that saying? Mm -hmm. Hashem, Moshe wrote the story of Eov to describe a person who really is going through the journey that Ami Sol went to. We're suffering. We demand that we don't have an explanation, right? So what do we do? Then Hashem, you know, which what the objective is, what we experience as Ami Sol, the realization that, you know, it's a whole, you know, there's a new way to look at it. Not to get stuck in that place. And uh, Eo did not is the person who doesn't get past that place. Yeah. So there, there's two things that I want to talk to you. I, I heard on the shear about the Rambam that the people who were dealing, dealing about the Zara, like in the Hegel, for instance, they were looking for a medium because they felt that they were too low. And the Vaita Zara was a medium. Like right. they, they, so originally, we, the mistake was that, that they wanted to have a medium, and then they forgot. And okay, then they okay. So we said that. So we just said that a different way. We said that a different way. They wanted to externalize their source of inspiration. In other words, if you know you're part of Hashem, in a way it takes away your Bechira, okay? And therefore they wanted to, like, drop that curtain. Now, by the way, the Egel, just like the Tadas, it's the same thing, okay? She wanted, it's the same thing. We have no time now. She, it's the human condition, which is, there is a curtain, obviously, it has to be there, but don't thicken it. Don't thicken it. Don't add to it. Don't say, I only want to operate in front of the curtain. And I feel, I, can, I, I get that. I, you know, I'm more in control of that. that. That's something I can handle. Once you start the whole big thing, A, it takes away at the degree of Bechira, and you don't get to just do whatever you want. So it's the same idea. It's the same what you're saying in different words. Okay, but, yeah. I want to ask you something else. What if a person, you say you don't see the whole picture, but sometimes a person is born disabled. Yeah. How could they see the whole picture? You're correct. And we don't see that part of not seeing the whole picture. That's all part of it. We don't understand. Hashem set up the laws of genetics. There's no question about it. And genetically things happen. By why this, you know, you know, but Hashem's hand is also in it. The combination, like, this is important. 
the combination of Hashem's big picture and our efforts and our work here to do the best we can with what we have and make decisions. What is that combination always referred to in Kabbalah? Hashem running the world and our doing, you know, taking initiative to do what we can do. What's that called in Kabbalah? Hmm? And called them what the Nevi'im all saw. What did the Nevi'im use to get a glimpse of? What's it called? <laughs> the Masa Merkava. The divine chariot. Remember, you see a chariot. You see, if you're looking at it, you see a horse running. You say, whoa, that horse is really pulling that chariot. But if you look a little closer, who's in the chariot? Mm -hmm. Oh, the driver who's doing nothing, who's in the chariot, is actually directing the horse. So this could be confusing. What happened at, her, at, at the Yamsuf? Sus v'rochbo rama v'yam. What's that saying? The horse was leading. The horse was leading. In other words, if a person opts to believe that the horse is the making, you know, is the explanation of all things, of how we got to where we're getting, you know, what we see in front of the curtain, that's the whole story. That will drag a person, sh flood a person, obviously, you know, that, will, that will, will ultimately be the person's destruction. They'll drag, they won't even be conscious, the driver, so to speak, will be ineffective completely. You ha we have to keep our awareness on, you know, on that balance. So, um, so that it is a, the whole effort is a person maintaining that sense of my job in this world is to be a source of that clarity. The mitzvahs help me do it, and always be aware that you, you know when I'm you know I, I my 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 abilities are limited. That's what the whole kohelis is about. Do not get distressed because you work so hard to accomplish something, even something noble, and. It falls apart in the next generation. It doesn't last. Somebody else sabotages it. It's okay. Kohelis is, by the way, a very, very positive book. It constantly goes back to the refrain. So what do you do here? You enjoy your efforts in your life that you do, that, that, and don't worry about you know, what happens beyond, and you can't change the whole world. Remember how Kohelis starts? Hevel, Havolim, Hevel, Hevel, Hevel. doesn't mean futile. doesn't mean this world is futile. It means it's fleeting. Our little... A little experience in front of the curtain goes very fast. But Hevel, the person Hevel, remember him? Yeah. Think about Hevel. He left no family, no kids, no huge family with a zillion grandkids. Okay? Not even one kid. No cities that he built. No great inventions or musical instruments or whatever they were inventing back then. Zero. No footprint. But he is the first person in creation that the Pasuk says, Vayesh Hashem el Hevel. Hashem was pleased with him. And at the end of the whole Torah, because he had the connection, the very last words Moshe Rabbeinu said to Am Yisrael, Ashrecha Yisrael. Fortunate, forward moving are you, Yisrael. Mi kamocha, who is like you? Am nosha, same words as Hevel. And Moshe, they say, is a Gilgal of Hevel. Am nosha bahashem, a nation delivered from the trap from being in front of the curtain by their understanding of Hashem. And that's the Arla Goyim in us. That's our message. Yeah. But it says afterwards that Moshe had been told Aaron the Korban Kadesh. And Aaron was exactly. there that they were greater than yes, us. Yes, exactly. So exactly. The fact that they wanted to be <coughs> and they wanted to operate in that way, that was wrong. But they so, were greater than the meaning the greater the person is, the more drawn a person's neshama is to the shechina. The more they don't feel separated, they know it's artificial. All they want is to let go, be putter from this physical world that we identify with so much as if it's real and get so caught up in it. The greater person is, the absolute greater danger it is to just suck back in. That's why they have to have much more gedarm. That's why when Moshe came to see the sneh, Hashem said, I'll take Rav Halom, don't come any closer. And Moshe covered his eyes. The greater you are, the more danger you're in, because the more you want it, the more you want to give up your whole self and go back, because that's who you really are. And by the way, these stories of people that have near-death experiences, with the tunnel and the whole thing, and then the light, mm -hmm. the, I don't know, because the two people I know in my life, <laughs> um, yeah, two people in this community, 
who both died and were brought back. And I said, so tell me about the tunnel and the light. And they're like, well, I don't know, I didn't see it. <laughs> so I'm like, you're useless. <laughs> so we do it again. Obviously, they weren't quite dead. But the point is, people, <laughs> people speak about this, but the one thing they all say is that light is something so loving and calming and perfect and warm and, per, you know, just utter love and inclusion and whatever it is. That's, it jives with what we're saying. You're saying you, it was good that they wanted to be sucked in, but they really should have kept Right. Sort of You're not allowed to commit suicide. Now, listen, a person who commits suicide out of total distress, they're a chola. But what that really means is, babe, there's no, you're not allowed to suicide like the Japanese kamikazes or these cultural suicide things. But no, a person's not even allowed to let themselves be sucked back into the shechina. You're supposed to live. So that was a mistake, but they were still greater. They, they because I'll bring different mistakes, but they were very great. Moshe said, I thought it would be me or you who would get sucked in, but clearly they were even greater. Yeah. I hear from other friend, beautiful boy that always gives me the hammer. When he said that, when Hashem said to Moshe, you'll see my back. And Rabbi Friend says, it's not my back, it's after May of Esther, you will understand at the end of your Retroactive. life, you will understand. Like your grandfather says, with the kesher, the chesed, and the din, or however you want to send cross, you'll understand what was told, what was wrong, nothing right. was wrong. It's That's all right. told because right. at this point, we can't understand anything. The, we right. really, I mean, everything that you said today, I loved. But bottom line, yes. we don't understand. And also, there's another thing. If we go too much into that headspace of it's there's no Ra, we're in danger of being unsympathetic, a little less, you know, a little less in pain for the other person because, hey, you know, it's all, it's, there's no Ra. And that's also not a place we can be in. But don't forget the Chazal say, really, everything's backwards. We should be melancholy. I think they even say cry when a person's born because they're entering this world, which could be a trap. And we should be joyous when they die because finally they're re re entering with, you know, we're the source. So, um, so, really no, because I'll say, really, we're not capable, we're not capable of it. We do have that concept on a certain level because we celebrate a yard right. And we celebrate because we celebrate the life that these people live. So we don't celebrate it when they die. in the fullness of their, we're not. Well, no, of course not. Died, of course not. Of course. Right. Right. Every day is a day. Yes, Essa. Again, um, uh, a mace, we, her mace is not. We are Tame. We're Tame because the natural default human mode is death means life is over. We just can't get away from that. No matter how much we hear these philosophical ideas, we really say death means it's over, as if it's over. But that makes us tummy. That's it. That's, tummy is a mental, spiritual state of mind that there's, we're really not eternal. We're really, there's really a, you know, there's a, there's a it's getting stuck down here in what we see. That's what makes us tummy. That's sort of her says, when we, uh, when a woman is a nida, they're tummy, because every nida is a potential life that didn't happen. So we say, you know what? There's death here, but also I'm part of an animal cycle. Let's be honest, PMS. What am I fooling myself? I'm just like an animal. I have got a cycle that just takes control of me. I don't have. I'm not a spiritual entity. I'm like an animal, and that mindset is tummy. I want to, yes, let me say one more thing to just end this off, okay? The last, it's a beautiful thing. The last mitzvah of the Torah, based on that, thank you for, for the last mitzvah of the Torah before the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah for Moshe. The last mitzvah is called Vidoy Meiser, okay? One more second. Vidoy Meiser. You have to come with 10% of your crop. You don't give it to the Kohen or the Levi or the poor person. That you already did, the separate. You take 10% of your crop or the, fi or the, the um, monetary equivalent. You bring it to your shalai, and you must eat and drink or spend the money on food and drink and, or, and creams, nothing else. Things that your body physically enjoys. And then you have to say, vidoy meiser. Vidoy meiser means you go and you say to the Kohen, I have 
done all my uh, responsibilities, and I have brought my Meister to Yerushalayim. And I am basically eating and drinking and enjoying it here. And then you have to say this. I have not used mm -hmm. any of it, or the money equivalent of it, for anything that has to do with death. I have not used it for shrouds or a coffin or to pay burial expenses. Rav Hirsch says, why? Because what the last mitzvah of the Torah is saying is, when Hashem gives you your, what you have in this world, eat and drink, which is the message of Kohelis over and over again, eat and drink and enjoy it, and do not let thoughts of death, limitation, physicality, all the issues, do not let that cloud your capacity to enjoy the moment, the gift of the moment, and the, and the material gifts that help you see Hashem in this world. Okay, everybody, have a beautiful week. I hope.